I guess it looks better. That Welcome way. to the Smart HVAC Marketing Podcast, the podcast for HVAC contractors who are ready to quit screwing around and begin growing their business. Powered by Rival Digital. On this show, you'll hear from industry leaders and become equipped with the tools and knowledge you need to build a world-class business. Now, here's your host, Eric Thomas. Hello again, all of you smart HVAC contractors out there. My name is Eric Thomas. I'm the host of the Smart HVAC Marketing Podcast. Welcome back to another episode. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are expanding the show into CG2 right now. Some industry leaders that we feel uh, can really add some value to your business with just tons of insight and knowledge. And uh, we're super excited to continue sharing these episodes with you. If you have been tuning into the episodes and you have enjoyed it, I ask that you please leave us a review on Apple Podcast. Um, I, I have seen that a majority of our listeners are on Apple Podcast. And please if you get a chance, leave us a short review. Let us know how we're doing. Uh, we appreciate any and all feedback. So today we're joined by two folks who need no introduction. They are. Uh, HVAC Hall of Famers and <laughs> a very extensive history in the HVAC industry. Uh, John and Vicki LaPlante. Hi. Hi. How are you doing, Eric? Are hey, you Eric. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> he can talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you uh, who were listening, a little little background on how this all came about. We met John and Vicki LaPlante at Service World Expo, and we were at the, I guess it was the opening night, the after yeah, Gino Whitman's, uh, yeah, after Gino Whitman's workshop. Yeah, we went to the, uh, we went to the, it was supposed to be a, a mansion party, yeah. but I think there was some technical difficulties. We ended up meeting at a, a Ford dealership, which ended up being <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun. And so we, yeah, we ended up running into uh, John and Vicky there. One thing led to another. And um, here they are today on the podcast, ready to to share some some great tips and tricks and, and tell you guys more about uh, some of the stuff they've got going on. So let's go ahead and do some introductions for our listeners out there. Uh, we'll go, we'll go left or right here, ladies first. So Vicki, why don't you go ahead and introduce sure. yourself and let our listeners know a little bit more about you. Absolutely. Well, first I have to tell you a funny story, Eric and the other people that he was with from rival digital, they kept saying to us, is this Southern food? And we kept saying, yes, it's bad. Southern food. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They couldn't seem to get that part of it right, Eric, but they did an amazing job of, of rotating because of bad weather and moving us. But anyway, it, it, there were a few old cars for us to look at in addition mm -hmm. to new. Uh, John and I have been in the industry, uh, we say all together almost 100 years. I've been in it about 45, and he's been in it about 50, uh, well, getting close to 50. Yeah, a couple months away from 50. And uh, anyway, so it's been it's been a fantastic uh, learning experience. We both uh, worked for Linux in the beginning. That's actually where we met and married. Um, and then we went in and started our own business. Uh, called VLE, Vital Learning Experiences. And we worked for almost all of the different manufacturers of heating and air conditioning equipment and their distributors doing training for contractors. So why don't you pick up the story from there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a tremendous need in the industry ongoing for financial training. You know, a lot of companies are started by technicians, very good technicians on the installation and service side. And they decide they want their own business model, their own enterprise. And, and they're very good technically for service and installation. But, you know, we, we have to lower our voice a little bit on when it comes to how do you run a company from a financial standpoint? How do you feel comfortable with an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow statement? And so that's kind of the arena that uh, Vicki and I carved out. I'll say one thing. Um, Lennox Industries, Lennox International trained us very well. There was an individual there, Warren Crenshaw. He was a certified CPA focused strictly on turnaround situations with contractors in the Fort Worth Southwest Division. And he was nearing the end of his career. He kind of took us under wing and, and um, 
uh, it gave us the skill sets uh, that we needed to kind of continue his legacy. And then uh, five years ago, we uh, we were really ready to think about retiring. And Matt Michelle, who is the president of Service Nation, approached us. We talked with them and they said, hey, you want to if will you keep training if you don't have to travel? Because that was the part that was really burning John and I out. And that's so we've worked for Service Nation for the last uh, really. This is the sixth year, sixth year. I guess. And um Love those guys. It's a great, great um, service. If any of you've never explored the membership possibilities, uh, just go on serviceroundtable.com because there is so much great information um, that you know you have access to from marketing information to rebates to chats with other contractors. Absolutely. And you know, we've been doing this a long time and you know, the depth and breadth of resources that Service Nation brings to the industry, you know, is unparalleled. Uh, you know, the, the, they've got um, a number of contractors, close to 500 contractors in their top tier, the Alliance. And, uh, you know, they're the cream of the crop. You know, they're what, they're what drives the industry forward day over day. But they're not all huge. I mean, there are some big contractors in there, but we have a, not, a number of contractors that are part of the Alliance program that are less than a million dollars. So it's an opportunity to grow your business as well. So go on the website and explore that if you're interested. Yeah, I agree. I think that there are some amazing uh, business development, business growth opportunities that come with being a member of, of Service Roundtable. And I also agree that there's some very uh, strong vendors in the organization. Absolutely. Uh, that's the only thing I'll say about that. I think that <laughs> there's some, some awesome opportunities to partner up with, with amazing companies that are ready to help you grow your business. Uh, and then also when you have folks like John and Vicki there on your side, uh, helping you, helping you out, helping you navigate some of the difficulties where that come with those stages of development. Um, it's, re it's really good. And, and I think that we're stronger together. And that's the big thing. That's that's the big thing that I, I, I always try to recommend to folks that are starting off. A lot of the listeners on this show, from what I've heard, based on some feedback, um, typically between 200,000 to 2 million. It's very, uh, there, there's a lot of folks that listen to it who are in the either in the early stages uh -huh. or are at that phase where they're hitting 2 million. They're ready to really start thinking about a 5 million, 7 million, 10 million type growth trajectory. Yeah. And I always recommend to them get involved with some type of forum or uh, networking group with other contractors who you can learn yeah. from. Absolutely, Eric. I think that's critical. Um, guys, I will tell you, John and I work with a lot of, uh, a lot of new members that come in to Service Nation, um, who, you know, $500,000. And I will tell you guys, again, um, Service Nation has so many fantastic resources for you. I won't dwell on that part. We've already given them a, a nice commercial. But I will tell you, if you're in that size, I'm going to tell you the very, the most important thing you can do is hire someone in your office. And I know everybody goes, oh, no, but you're talking about costs. You know, you're not talking about a revenue generator. Well, initially in smaller businesses, you are the revenue generator. So you have to be in the field. And, you know, you don't want to be replacing a water heater or in an attic, replacing a furnace when all of a sudden there's a customer calling you. It's, it, it's not professional. It's very difficult for you. Um, so we would really encourage you if you're less than a million dollars and don't have somebody answering your phone, doesn't have to be from your office. Obviously, that would be perfect. But get get a professional um, person to um, take your calls, answer your calls, do your scheduling for you. That's going to help you get out of that truck faster than anything else that I can think of. Uh, yeah, what when would you, you add for the small? Yeah, well, when you look guy. at the you know the waterfront, uh, you know the the spectrum of size of companies, the biggest issue I think everybody would agree on is smaller companies. The owner uh, has to get out of the field, has to unplug from the day-to-day -day turning the wrench kind of activities and start focusing on the direction the, the company's going, you know, have some semblance of planning, some semblance of process development and process control in the company. And unless that happens, um, you know, an owner has a job, doesn't really have a company, doesn't mm -hmm. have, have an organization, doesn't have a 
you know, an architecture in place in terms of a business model that uh, can value, uh, you know, be valued of any substance, really, because it's a job. And so I think that's one of the biggest difficulties uh, with smaller companies, you know, trying to grow is that uh, getting unplugged from the field to to focus on the, the developmental needs of a business. Yeah. So after getting a someone to answer your phone, someone to kind of handle the dispatch and the customer service and stuff like that, uh, and then maybe getting a, a you know a, a helper or a technician to also run some calls. Mm-hmm. What do you all feel is the next big hump that a business owner needs to get over in order to fully get out of the truck and be able to be in the office day to day? He's got to get his pricing right. We John and I see that all the time, and really, it doesn't matter whether you're less than a million dollars or you know five, seven million. Usually, by the time companies get to maybe ten, twenty million, they figured out this whole pricing thing. But a lot of times, um, again, even two and three million dollar companies have not figured out the pricing issue. And guys, you've got to, you've got to understand what your costs are, not only the, you know, the cost of installing the equipment, um, you know, I mean, the cost that you pay for the equipment and then the cost if you're hiring someone to go install it for you. But you've got to understand that every business, even if you're doing business out of your home initially, um, you've got costs. You've got, you know, telephone costs. You're having to do some advertising. You've got vehicle costs. Um, You know, you've got you've got insurance costs. You've got a lot of costs that have to be recognized in your business and recovered in your pricing. So we would tell, again, probably the second thing we always do with Uh, smaller companies is get their service, get them on flat rate pricing. And there are a number of excellent programs out there that you can purchase, some of which are are very affordable. um, And then some of which get a little more sophisticated and cost a little more because they offer different options. But you definitely, another reason to join uh, course service roundtable is because we, we have, uh, you know, we've, we've vetted, um, these different pricing programs. And we've got three or four that are just excellent that mm-hmm. people should look into. But what would you say? Would you say pricing? Well, I say it goes in tandem. Yeah, the, you know, the first thing is uh, <laughs> that we work on is get the chart of accounts right for departmentalized uh, financials. Um, the second thing, um, and right closely coupled to that, is the pricing, installation and service pricing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, again, Service Nation Alliance um has the tools in the, they've got a resource center to make this as seamless and as easy as possible. Um, the other thing that we see emerging now, more important than ever, when I got in this industry in 1972, the focus was pretty much on the manufacturer in the box. Mm-hmm. And now that's transitioned. The focus is on brand identity, you know, in the marketplace and value proposition. And so once you get the pricing right to justify Um, uh, to justify the pricing, you have to have the value proposition and you have to be focused Mm -hmm. on, you know, differentiating your service model from other service models to make them as unique as possible. And with the uh, last uh, 2024 months going on, we've seen a lot of companies kind of retool in terms of, you know, touchless service, uh, you know, to Mm -hmm. make customers feel uh, comfortable. Uh, the, the, the Alliance just came out with a, a new marketing place is that uh, uh, give your home a flu shot, basically I indoor air quality, yeah. you know, the application of an accessory to create a healthier living environment, not only a comfortable living environment, but a healthy living environment. See, guys, that's a marketing tip. You can use that phrase (laughs) without ever joining Service Roundtable. I don't want to make us sound like we're just doing a commercial for them. (laughs) One of the things, Eric, that I would also emphasize uh, on that pricing thing, too, is uh, this past year, particularly, it started kind of at the end of last year, but prices have just gone up and up and up. We all know the issues with the display, uh, with the, um, you know, the, the yeah, supply what, chain. yeah, thank you. The <laughs> supply, that's why we work well together. We can <laughs> each other's words. Uh, yeah, if I have a mental lapse, you can't yeah, hear yeah. whatever. Uh, so, yeah, the supply chain and They've had to raise prices and raise prices. And the typical contractor, guys, you're too busy. You get so busy again out there, you know, working in the field and stuff. You don't pay attention to those price increases. And so that's why it's more important than ever. We never end a seminar that John and I do without saying, 
when you leave our seminar. So I would say today, when you leave this podcast, raise all of your service prices, $10 and put a hundred extra dollars on every install you do. No one's going to notice. No one's going to like throw, you know, say you're not, uh, uh, you're too high on a service call because you raised it 10 bucks. Yeah. You're there, you're taking care of a problem they have. So um, guys, you just got to stay on top of that. The other thing I would say, maybe after we get pricing, um, I know whenever we're somebody saying, well, what can I do? What's the smartest thing I can do? I have a very limited budget in marketing. Mm -hmm. Of course, all the social media things you can do because they're very cost effective. I'll give a little plug for Rival here are, are fantastic. But I will tell you, if you only have $5,000 to spend, wrap a truck get a get a bright get bright signage get your logo you know buy one of those yellow blue trucks with something that really catches the eye even one truck uh, people tell us all the time you know i just wrapped one truck and everybody is calling me and saying wow i didn't know you had gotten that big i see your trucks all over town well it's mm -hmm. one truck but because it yeah. stands out mm -hmm you know, people notice it. Well, and that's part of that brand identity too. It's, exactly. Uh, that you were talking about. And, and now more than ever, we have brand um, uh, uh, focus, you know, cultural focus of a company. And that goes right, right in lockstep with, uh, with yeah. brand, you know, HVAC companies are becoming known as preferred places of employment because of culture, because of professionalism more than, than ever before. You know, our industry stands out, whether it's HVAC plumbing, electrical, uh, remodel contractors, you know, the whole contracting trades are professional and essential. Absolutely. Yeah. I was reading an article this morning, in fact, about the great resignation guys. And there are a lot of people obviously leaving their jobs. You can't help but pick up something and read about it. Young people mm -hmm. who don't realize how great our industry is to work in. They don't realize that a, that a service technician, one, you've got a career for life and two, that you can make, you know, six figures in this industry as a, as a, you know, service technician, one who knows what he's doing, but two is a good communicator with the customer. Mm -hmm. So, um, and an I installation think, professional, absolutely. the same thing. But the key yeah, is, yeah. And, and the reason the great resignation is occurring is because people say, I just don't want to work in this environment anymore that I was working in. So culture becomes even more critical, I think, um, you know, for, for, for companies to have, to give young people a place they care about, that they want to work and that also understands, you know, young people today, unlike us baby boomers, uh, they, they, uh, you know, they appreciate that work-life balance better than we did. We were all about work because that was defining who we were. But I think young people today, um, you know, they, they do a much better job of that. So again, part of what you got to figure out is how you can, again, create this culture where people feel like they're doing something. Young people especially feel like they're doing something that makes a difference that also doesn't make the job become their entire life, that they are able to have, you know, a life afterwards. And, and I know that requires some issues because of what we do. But, you know, there are some ways that you can schedule four day work weeks. There's some smart strategies you can do to, uh, you know, again, have the after hours managed properly uh, for after hours calls that, again, uh, are very appealing to young people, I think. Well, and that's a very good example. The, um, you know, after hour service, on call service, we see that changing dramatically mm -hmm. in the industry right now in recognition of this lifestyle issue. Uh, for our industry so employees can balance a family and their profession. Yeah. And you know, when I was, when I was at service world expo, when I was on the, I was on the recruiting panel there and yeah. I was fortunate enough to be uh, joined with, you know, several people who are, are far smarter than I am in regards to recruiting. And uh, they were sharing some ideas that they've done uh -huh. to recruit and attract, you know, the top talent. And, and one thing I will say is that really right now, the power is in the hands of the job seeker. When it comes to yes. finding that work-life balance, because, you know, um, company A might offer Monday through Friday, 10 hour work days, and then you get, or Monday through Thursday, 10 hour mm -hmm. work days, and then you get Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. Company B might offer, 
you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, no weekends. Company C might offer six day, six hour work days every day of the week. So you have the ability to go find which one works best for you versus in the past where you kind of were just at the mercy of whoever was hiring. Yeah, exactly right, Eric. And we're seeing all kinds of combinations of that. And even guys, I know maybe we're talking about a little larger company, but if you have even four techs, you can manage a four day work week. Uh, we, we know companies that have contractors who've made that happen. They can rotate their schedule well enough that you can offer that four day work week. So it is possible, even if you're not huge, if you think we're talking about huge companies, we're not. Yeah. And it's even easier now because I would say a large majority of the, the workforce is, is at home now. Yes. Uh, I, I come to the office because this is where my podcasting setup's at, but uh, you know, a, a majority of the people are at home now working. Yep. So being available for a technician to come at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday is not nearly as hard as it used yes. to be. Well, Very I, much so. I think one of the um, other kind of business circumstances we're dancing around uh, right now is the fact that um, people are more receptive to change now, I believe, and innovation. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. being forced a little bit by technology, a little bit about the, you know, the COVID uh, situation going on. But, um, you know, the companies that Vicki and I work with are much more receptive to trying new things than mm -hmm. I can I can ever remember. Yeah. And, and partly it's getting rid of us baby boomers. <laughs> well, <that's good. laughs> we have younger owners coming in and that that's good. And that, you know, Eric, just that triggered something for me. One of the things we're really seeing right now is this all this activity and companies buying existing heating and air conditioning companies and plumbing companies as well. And, you know, that's a great thing. Um, but I will also tell you, we've seen a lot of younger owners, meaning owners less than 50 years old, being bought out. And now all of a sudden, now uh, some of them stay and work in the business after it's been bought, but some of them are going, now what am I going to do? And I will tell you that it's a great opportunity for you as a smaller business to try and attract, get a mentor, get a consultant from one of these companies that has sold a very successful business and, uh, you know, bring them in to help show you the ropes, cut, you know, cut that, uh, shorten that length of time it takes you to be mm -hmm. that big company. So I think the positive side for a company today is to look for, because there's a lot of these owners out there with a wealth of knowledge that don't want to quit working. They're too young. They're not ready to retire. Yeah. And I think that's one of those absolutes, you know, it's an imperative going forward, whether you're preparing to sell or not, you should be focused on building the value yeah. of your enterprise. Uh, business valuations are, are difficult. You know, the M and a world uh, can be painful, the mergers and acquisition world. Um, but regardless of, you know, whether you're looking to sell or not, you want to constantly be building value in that enterprise because at some point, at some point, it will have to have a transaction, either to family, to employees, to someone in the industry or someone outside of the industry. And you want to do the things that build the opportunity for top dollar, you know, the highest multiple against EBITDA, uh, earnings before, you know, interest taxes, amortization, depreciation, uh, because there are there are some fantastic multiples out there right now. And, you know, I think, too, what what's real critical on all that as well is just guys be building your bit, you know, work on your profits, be building your maintenance agreements, maintenance agreements add a great deal of value to a um, anyone looking to purchase your company and think about it. You know, if you're in a family business, as many of us are in this industry, um, you know, sit down and have a serious discussion. If you've got children in the business, do they want to stay in the business? Do they want to run the business? Um, maybe they just want to work there. We know of some companies where just because the son or daughter worked in the business, it didn't mean they wanted to become the next GM or president. And, you know, they, they kind of like what they're doing. We had an example where um, a son was, he loved sales. That's what he did. He was great at it. And a son-in-law came in to be the general manager and they worked through that. 
So again, be thinking, um, it, it, and Tom was able, the mm -hmm. owner of the company was able to retire at like 57. Um, so, you know, really think through and how, um, again, you can be, um, uh, be planning for, even if you're in your late thirties, early forties, it's not too soon to be, you know, thinking about different exit strategies. And just one other last comment on that. You cannot value a company uh, properly without financials, that income yeah. statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement. So regardless of your size, regardless how long you've been in business, you know, get your financials in shape. Yeah. It's going to help you manage going forward. And when the time comes, it's going to accelerate the valuation process. And Absolutely. guys, that generally requires working with a professional, working yeah. with an accountant, working with someone who truly, if you're using QuickBooks, as most of our contractors do, someone who really knows how to work QuickBooks. We've seen um, companies who have someone that's doing the books, but then when we look at them, you know, they're not, they're a mess. They don't have real good numbers in them. Yeah. And I completely agree with that, with the maintenance agreements, building that up. Mm -hmm. That's something I've, I've hit on a few times on the podcast over yeah. the past few weeks. And I feel yeah. like that by now I should just write an article on it because it's <laughs> yeah, come up so much. It's the obvious this is apparent, but if you can understand the lifetime value of a customer mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. just thinking of oh, yeah. that maintenance agreement's only $25 a month. Well, yeah. if you think about that $25 a month times 12 months, you're, you know, you're looking at on average between two fifty and $300 a year yeah. per customer, that customer on average is going to live in their home for about 11 years. Mm -hmm. So before it's all said and done, you're looking at, you know, roughly $4,000 yeah. in just that maintenance agreement from that customer. And that doesn't include the repairs, the replacements, all the other exactly. opportunities that are going to come with it. And so that's why I think maintenance agreements are a lot. I think a lot of people are beginning to realize that that's the way to go. And like you were saying, when, when an acquisition comes about, one of the first things they're going to ask is how many active service yeah. agreements do you have? What's your customer base look like? Do you have all their contact information? Et cetera, Absolutely. Et yep. Eric, in maintenance agreements are too. When a new owner comes in, maintenance agreements are that guaranteed revenue stream, that guaranteed mm -hmm. cash flow. And they love that. Someone buying a company loves that fact that, oh, this is, you know, this is going to, doesn't matter. It's going to keep coming into the company. Absolutely. Well, I think that we have definitely covered a lot of some good topics. Sure. I, I try to, I try to limit how much we dig into the weeds on stuff because then it yeah. becomes information overload for our listeners. Absolutely. I always tell them, I always tell them, find one thing from the podcast and implement it. If anything else, just one thing. So hopefully, you, you listeners out there were able to find one thing uh, that you guys were able to implement. But we're going to switch the conversation a little bit more towards. Uh, our really our main topic, which is mm -hmm. the Ghost of Grow Foundation, which yeah. John and Vicky are. Oh yeah, John. John, John wants you. The, oh, I got it. John wants you to see his shirt. Let's see so, where there, there it is. Go. I got it. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, he's got that. Go. Yeah, there it is. All the right. Ghost of Grow Foundation. <laughs> he That's wore that awesome. shirt for all the all the people that wouldn't just be listening would be watching as well today. Absolutely. Well. Uh, I know that this is a topic in, in a discussion that you guys are very, very passionate about. So I'm yes. going to let you all take the floor and tell everyone about the Joseph Grove Foundation and uh, what all it means and what it means to you and then how others can get involved and help. Um, the Joseph Grove Foundation, to our knowledge, and we've been doing, uh, had this foundation or worked with this foundation for 11 years, is the only um, foundation or charity that helps uh, members in the contracting industry. We are focused solely on helping anyone in any aspect of contracting, not just heating and air conditioning or plumbing, but anyone who's had a life altering accident uh, or illness continue living a very productive life. And we help pay for, we provide grants um, and we help pay for things that insurance doesn't cover when someone's been hurt. Uh, ramps, vehicle conversions, bathroom remodels are a huge thing. And our foundation takes care of, again, it's not something, it's not like you have to be injured on the job. I mean, we've helped lots of people who, please wear your helmet, who have been hurt on motorcycle accidents, um, who have, you know, had car accidents, people who've fallen off ladders, those kinds of things too. We also have helped family members of people in the contracting industry. 
Uh, we've helped people with children who have been born with spina bifida or something. And as they grow, they need, again, ramps or lifts to get in vehicles and that kind of thing. So um, as long as there is a connection, a strong connection to the contracting industry, we're available. And I would urge everyone, please um, go to and, and the foundation name, please go look at our website. It's Joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H, grow, G-R-O-H, foundation.org. Um, in the last 11 years, and John and I are on the board, we are a 501c3 uh, uh, foundation. So obviously it's a charitable uh, donation. We have uh, given back $750,000 to about 72 families. And we say family wow. because, um, you know, it helps everyone in the family, uh, the caregivers, as well as the person who is, you know, has the situation. Um, so it, it really does make a difference. And we have a fantastic program. And I know I'm running over and I'll talk about the Luminary program. Um, I, I want you to think about... Uh, all the things you spend ten dollars a month on, uh, you know. John teases me because I have to go to Starbucks, and my grand granddaughter loves Starbucks too. And you know, two cups of coffee at Starbucks is ten dollars, and unfortunately, yeah. we do it more than once a month. It's that much. Yeah. Uh -oh. We have a great program. If you go on the website, look at the luminary thing, and for ten dollars a month, a contribution, you can make a significant difference in the life of others. Yeah. So what are some what are some other things that the foundation does throughout the year and and what are some of the goals that you all have some what are some of the financial goals you have just for just for the record for people to be able to understand how they might be able to contribute Absolutely um we well, we do golf tournaments. That's one of our major fundraisers. And of course, we're always looking for sponsors next year. And of course, the pandemic hit us really hard um, because, you know, we couldn't have golf tournaments. So last year was a tough year. Um, and you, if you go on our website, there's a list of the recipients uh, whom we have helped. And you'll see there weren't a lot in 2020 simply because we didn't have the funds. Um, so this year we're uh, in 2022 we're having our last golf tournament for 2021 in dallas so if we have any listeners in the dallas area that's coming up october 26th it's a monday uh so please uh, check your calendar would love you can come and just play golf we'll put you on a team or if you want to get a team together um it's a great day of camaraderie a great day of again uh giving back you're having fun but you're giving back to again people who need it uh, next year, we'll be having a golf tournament in Minneapolis, Chicago, Dallas, and we're adding Atlanta for the first time. And we're very excited about that. So look for the, all that information is on the foundation. And then, as I said, the, probably the biggest thing and what we realized the pandemic brought us through was, hey, we've got to have another source for funding because the golf tournaments were our major source. And that's the Luminary program. Um, Rival Digital, the company that's sponsoring this podcast, made a wonderful donation as a luminary uh, to the foundation. And you can make a one-time donation or you can make a monthly donation, as I talked about, because $10 a month makes a difference. But that's our primary um, funding um, activity right now. In addition to, of course, raising funds and providing grants, one of the other things that I'm very passionate about is um, the fact that if you as a contractor and or you have employees do not have short term and long term disability insurance, please, please, please get it. Um, and that means that's, you know, of course, I use the example of AFLAC because it's so well known, but that's where your income at some rate can continue if you are disabled, even for a short period of time, three months to six months or for a lifetime. Um, Joe Grow, our, uh, the, the person who the foundation is named after, worked in our industry. His children still work in the HVAC. Four generations. Yeah, four, yeah. his oh, grandfather wow. was a contractor. His dad, dad worked for Linux eventually and his children, uh, one works for a contractor and two of them, well, two actually do. And one works for a large manufacturer in the industry. But Joe was out riding his bicycle one day, thrown over his handlebars and woke up a quadriplegic. So um, and that was kind of his motivation. And 
he says he will tell anyone who asked him if I had not had long-term disability, he said we would have, you know, I mean, he's like most of us. He, he had some savings, but it certainly wasn't going to be savings that has taken him through the last 12 years of his disability. So guys, it is critical, critical, critical. We are very passionate. And that's one of the things um, that we work on. We do have a relationship um, if you go to uh, CES Comprehensive Employment Services, they have a um, insurance arm that can provide for your company, can give you some pretty good rates on um, all kinds of insurance, but particularly short term and long term disability insurance for yourself and for um, your um, your employees, uh, because most I don't, people don't realize this, but most of the bankruptcies in the United States and most of the home foreclosures are caused by some type of accident or illness, even a heart attack that could cause you to be out of work for, you know, three to six months um, can, can devastate people financially. So please, please, that's, so one of our arms is grants. Another of our arms is really promoting uh, long-term and short-term disability. And the third one is being a web website. Uh, the, if you go on the website that has, um, again, uh, uh, information, uh, information. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, why don't you talk about that? <laughs> the resources, all kinds of resources, because that's the first thing Joe found after he was injured was, you know, there wasn't a lot of places that you could go to get information about what was available, you know, what kind of help statewide, locally, um, what was available from foundations. Most people immediately, if in a situation where they've been paralyzed, think about the Christopher Reeve Foundation. It's a great resource, but Christopher Reeve's, most of their monies go to looking, which is great, research and development to help people maybe look for long-term solutions to spine injuries. Um, and that's fantastic, but you need sometimes when you're in that immediate situation, that's not what you need. You need the things like what our foundation provides. So Joe has done a fantastic job of putting together all and resources for where do I get a van conversion? Where do I, you know, who can help me build the ramp? Those kinds of things. So I think it's really um, critical. Those are our, our three main goals uh, mm -hmm. that we we follow with the foundation. <clears throat> and right now we're focused on expanding the base of the foundation. We know that sustainability is a, a factor going forward. And, you know, the next generation in the industry, the generation after that, there's always going to be a need for this Joseph Grow Foundation. And so we want to get uh, as many people involved in terms of contributions as possible. Yeah. For the industry with this, with this issue, there are no competitors. We're just trying to make uh, the family yeah. of companies in this industry um, weather some unfortunate storms. And when that happens, there's no competitors. Everybody works together. Yeah. And one of the things, if you're listening to this as a contractor, um, you know, would be fantastic is a lot of times if someone particularly like a bathroom remodel, um, we, we provide, the foundation provides the cost of the materials and then a local uh, contractor will actually provide the labor. Um, and that can be very helpful, guys. I can't tell you how much because, again, that doubles our ability to help, you know, to help people. A bathroom model typically, if we have to pay for all aspects of it, can cost for 10, from ten to $15,000. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if you think about, what if if we can get the materials and you donate the labor, you know, we're talking about cutting that in half. And uh, that means we can help two people instead of one. And uh, so that's a fantastic way to get involved. We also are always looking for people who want to do fundraising with their companies. We have a, a number of contractors who love to do things. They'll have a, you know, in fact, an example not too long ago, John and I got to go up to a contractor who presented the foundation uh, a $1,500 check because in their company every month, someone got to pick a charity or a or foundation that they wanted to donate some monies to. And the company would give a certain percentage of every service ticket. I don't know what it was. Um, 
for that month to that foundation, which was a wonderful thing. Talk about building culture. Mm -hmm. And one month, one of the technicians chose the Joseph Grove Foundation. So things like that, guys, we love. It builds camaraderie in your company. It builds a culture in your company. And then it's a great way to give back not only to uh, our foundation, but to, you know, any other foundations that employees in your company might be passionate about. So consider doing that um, as well. Yeah. Yeah, I know that we were, you know, we were as a company looking for an organization to start getting involved with. You know, we are a younger company. We're right over a year old now. And so the first year we were like, well, we need to find a good foundation or something to get involved with that is rel- you know, relatively, you know, you know, relevant to our industry and who we serve as well. Um, but also has, you know, a good impact. And I, I'm really glad that we ran into you all at that, yeah. at that Ford dealership. Uh, <laughs> what did you the, buy one of those all electric Mustangs that's on yeah, the market now? There was one yeah. Here in the <laughs> Yeah, some of those cars, they, I think they had like a 1998 Ford Explorer with like a dent in the bumper. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Inventory was down because yes, had- <laughs> it was down. It's down all over, unfortunately. But yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're, we definitely enjoy being able to uh, do stuff like this. And we look forward to um, contributing more in the future, more on a recurring basis uh, to this foundation and then finding any way we can to get involved because, you know, like I said earlier, we're, you know, we're all stronger together. And, you know, finding ways to help each other out is, is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. So, Eric, Eric I, I mean, I can go on, but I think we probably, is this about the length you usually go for your podcast? Yeah, it's usually pretty open-ended. You know, sometimes we go, sometimes we go 20, 25 minutes. There's been times we've gone for an hour and a half. Uh, it just, oh, it just well, depends. We want to do that <laughs> <too>. <laughs> But yeah, I think that this is, I think we Good. definitely have, have hit a pretty solid mark here. So uh, before we hop off, I'll let, I'll give you guys another chance to uh, just let our listeners know of a good way to get in touch with you yes. all or learn more about the foundation. Absolutely. Um, you can go to the foundation. Um, it's, it's, I should know it's hope at uh, Joseph Grove yeah. Foundation. It's hope at Joseph Grove Foundation.org. If you'd like to send an email and again, or just go on the website and it will show you where to send a message. And it's Joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H, grow, G-R-O-H, foundation.org. And then two guys, if you want to send John or I a, a message about it as well, you can just send that to V, V is in Vicky, uh, LaPlant, and it's up there on it. Well, let me spell it for those listening, L-A-P-L-A-N-T at servicenation.com and to reach john you just put a j in place of the v laplant at servicenation.com and we also will um you know answer any questions or get your questions or anything else that you would like to talk with us about concerning the foundation to the right people so appreciate it so much eric appreciate this opportunity thank you for rival digital both for making a very generous contribution to the foundation and also for giving us this opportunity to talk about something we are very passionate about absolutely, absolutely. yeah thank you thank you all for joining me uh i i will uh, look forward to talking to you all soon and i hope you have a great rest of your morning Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Eric. All right. All right. Bye. Bye, guys.